Good evening and welcome to Phoenix Fellowship Live. We're so glad that you joined us tonight. I'm Pastor Daryl Chilson and this evening's study is a continuation of our series of studies in Bible prophecy. Tonight we examine Daniel's template of prophecy. Thank you for joining us. Let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, tonight we call upon you to act on our behalf by giving us a good live stream, number one. Number two, by speaking to us through your word. Thank you for every person who has joined in this gathering. I pray that you will bless each of us as we open your word and see what you have told us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to begin with a verse of scripture that comes from the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 9, beginning, God says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand. And I will do all my pleasure, calling a bird of us. I have purposed it, and I will also do it. That's the promise of God to us. God is an amazing God, and he has given us amazing, an amazing book, the Bible. When I prepare for these messages, my heart is stirred with just how grand God is and how beautiful the messages are and how interconnected throughout the scriptures. We find various stories. We will probably connect a little bit tonight as we talk about Daniel and Daniel's story, which begins in chapter one. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Daniel. I hope you have your Bible with you because it will help as we look over the story of Daniel that precedes the vision that he interpreted for Nebuchadnezzar. The story takes place approximately 605 BC, approximately 600 years before the birth of Jesus. So there's a lot of time that takes place, a lot of events that transpire from the time of Daniel until the time of Jesus and Matthew 24, which we have been using as our template of prophecy. So in Daniel's writings, we have a lot of history that has already transpired when Jesus gives us the Matthew 24 template. Some of that history we're going to look at tonight. It's going to be so interesting. In Daniel 1, we have a couple of characters that I want to actually introduce you to. First of all, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was born in about 634 BC, so he was just under 30 years old when he went to battle against Jerusalem, against Jehoiakim, who we will have a little bit of a, a little bit of background on him as well. When he besieges Jerusalem and takes Daniel and his three friends and others captive back to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had a father by the name of Nabopolassar. He was actually king at the time that Nebuchadnezzar sieged Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar was born a crown prince. He was trained in understanding of the gods of Babylon. He was, under, uh, uh, he was trained in the, the laws of Babylon, and he was trained in warfare. His father was a mighty warrior. In fact, while Nebuchadnezzar was a boy, Babylon was under the control of Assyria. And Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's father, actually went to battle against Assyria and established the kingdom of Babylon more firmly so that when Nebuchadnezzar actually took the throne. Babylon was the world power of that time. That was the major power in the world at that time. So that's a little bit of history on Nebuchadnezzar. Who was Jehoiakim? Jehoiakim was the king of the southern kingdom of Israel 
when Nebuchadnezzar was making his conquests and extending the kingdom of Babylon. Jehoiakim was an evil king in the sense that he led Israel in idolatry. And when we read some of the things that are in 2 Kings, I invite you to go back and spend some time in 2 Kings especially, where you, we have the story of Hezekiah and the kings. Hezekiah was a good king for the most part. And there were a couple of kings that followed him that were also idolatrous and led Israel in the wrong direction. And then there was Josiah, the good king. Remember the good king Josiah? He took the throne when he was a young boy. And following him was his second son, Jehoiakim, who was also an idolatrous king and led Israel in idolatry and all that went along with that. So that's who was on the throne in the southern kingdom of Israel when Nebuchadnezzar made his conquest and besieged the city and took Daniel and his three friends and quite a number of other people with him back to Babylon. So I'm just gonna tell you the story as we go along in chapter one and the beginning part of chapter two, rather than read it all because it is quite lengthy. We've got two chapters that we're gonna to cover tonight. So Daniel and his three friends are taken back to Babylon. They are immediately put into a class of individuals that would ultimately become a part of the magicians and astrologers, the counselors to the king. And they were given three years of training and special diet and, and at least the king's diet. They gave them, they gave these trainees the very best diet that they thought possible at that time. Of course, Daniel, for those of you who are vegetarian, might be interested in knowing that he was a vegetarian. And he had to ask for special permission to have a vegetarian diet while he was in this three years of training. When those three years were up, Daniel and his three friends went before the king to be checked out, to be interviewed, to be looked at and questioned. And the Bible says they were three times better than all the others that were brought before the king. So they went into the king's service. So they had had three years in training and then we have Nebuchadnezzar in chapter two. It says in his second year of reign, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Have you ever had a dream that you couldn't remember and you wished you could because it was so intense, maybe something interesting, something you kind of woke up to and for a few moments you remembered back kind of pieces of the, the dream perhaps, and then you tried to tell it and you couldn't remember tell your family, you couldn't remember it all. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he didn't remember any of it, but it was so important to him. God wanted to speak to Nebuchadnezzar through this dream and he impressed upon Nebuchadnezzar the importance of this dream. And so Nebuchadnezzar calls his best, his astrologers, his counselors, the magicians, the people who claim to be able to answer the kinds of questions that Nebuchadnezzar was asking. And that was, I want you to tell me, not only in the interpretation of my dream, but I want you to tell me what I dreamed. What did I dream? You have to tell me that, and then you have to tell me the meaning of it. And if you can't do that, you will die. You and your household, you will die. If you can do it, I will give you all kinds of rewards and presents and things to add to your life and your treasures. And so, of course, the magicians and the astrologers and the counselors of Nebuchadnezzar were not able to do it. And they said, oh, king, this is impossible. Nobody can do this. And he said, you're just stalling for time. I demand that you tell me my dream and the interpretation. And if you can't, you're all gonna die. 
And so they couldn't. So Nebuchadnezzar sent his chief guard out and began gathering these magicians and counselors together to murder them, to kill them. Well, of course, among them were Daniel and his three friends. And Daniel, when, they, when the, the guard, Ariok, approached them, they said, what's this all about? Why are we having, why are you doing this? We worship the God of heaven and God knows these things. Give us time to talk about it and pray about it and we will come back to you. And so the guard did and he gave them some time and that night God gave Daniel the very same dream Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed and he showed him the meaning of that dream. And so Ariok brought Daniel before the king. And this is where we're going to pick up, actually. Daniel chapter 2 and beginning with verse 27. We have a slide for you so that you can read this along with me. Daniel chapter 2, beginning with verse 27. So the king in verse 26 says, Okay, Daniel, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. This is an important phrase, and we don't need to go to the next verses yet. I just want to comment about this for a moment and say that this is about history, and you will find this in Daniel chapter 2, as well as some of the other prophecy that will follow, that carries us from the time of Daniel all the way to the end of time. And he says, God will make known to the king what will be in the latter days. As for you, O king, Thoughts came to your mind while you were on your bed about what would come to pass. Again, there's mention of it. What would come to pass after this? And he who reveals secret, get this, has made, to you, has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes. In other words, God has revealed this to Daniel in part to save the lives of Daniel and his three friends. At least that's what Daniel is feeling at that moment in time. I don't blame him. And his life would be spared as a result. And Daniel says, God is giving us this understanding to tell you, not only to show you what will be in the latter times, what is going to come in the future, but also to save our lives. So let's go then to verse 31, where it says, you, O king, as now you're gonna tell him the dream, you, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze. And you watched while a stone was cut out without hands. What, what does that tell you? This is symbolic of a divine hand. You saw a stone cut without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Amazing dream, isn't it? And this is an image 
And it kind of gives us an idea of what Nebuchadnezzar saw in this dream. The image, you'll see the head is of gold. The chest and uh, shoulders are, are silver and there's bronze and iron. The legs are of iron and the feet are a mixture of iron and ceramic clay. So there are three things that I want you to, to understand and notice in this chapter, three things. Number one, God wants us to know what is coming. He is not someone who is planning our future and all that is going to take place between now and his return. He is not someone who wants to keep that from us. Prophecy is to be understood. He is the revealer of secrets, and he wants us to know. We learned that from our study of Matthew 24 and of Revelation 6. The second thing I want to show you is that in Daniel's template, God is going to interpret the meaning. He's going to make clear what the meaning of this vision is, this dream is. You see, when we look at the template that Jesus gave us in Matthew 24, he told us exactly what was going to take place. The only difference between what he told us and what Daniel is going to tell us in his book, in, in the book of Daniel, is that Daniel's vision, Daniel's dream, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, goes all the way back to 600 years before the birth of Christ. Jesus started with his template of prophecy at the end of his ministry, just before his crucifixion. And so Daniel in chapter two of the book of Daniel gives us his template of prophecy that carries us all the way. And this is the third point I wanna make. This dream, this vision is a complete sweep of time to Jesus' return to the end. This vision that Daniel had of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, this dream that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his sleep is a history of time all the way from 605 approximately BC until the return of Jesus Christ. What do you think that stone is that was cut without a hand that comes and crushes all the kingdoms of the earth and becomes a giant kingdom that would last forever and ever. That is nothing less than the kingdom of God itself. So let's continue as we watch this unfold before our eyes in Daniel 2, beginning with verse 36. So Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, this is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. So listen. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hands, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom. So when he says to Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold, he's talking about you as the king of Babylonian kingdom, because the next verses down here tell us that each of these metals represent a kingdom, not just a king. So Nebuchadnezzar is the king and Babylon is the kingdom. After you, verse 39, it says, after you will arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. These are worldwide kingdoms. Don't forget what we learned earlier on. 
Anything that is significant in prophecy is worldwide in nature. Little things that happen in the earth, here and there, no matter how significant they may be for the people involved, if it is not a worldwide event, if it is not representing a worldwide kingdom as we are looking at kingdoms here in prophecy, it is not significant in itself. So then verse 40 says, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. We will look at some history here in just a moment and notice how these, these words represent the kingdoms that followed the kingdom of Babylon. Now let's look at verse 44 and 45. Mm -hmm. Verse 40, rather. 41. 41, sorry. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. So this is a description of kingdoms of the earth that are actually not world kingdoms per se, but rather they are various kingdoms that would come from the kingdom of iron, which we will talk about in a moment. And then finally, in verses 44 and 45, we read these words. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It will be the last one. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. And then Daniel says, the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. So let's look at history a little bit. What took place during the time that transpired after the king of Babylon, after the, the kingdom of Babylon? What took place afterward? So we have a slide that shows the same image with some dates and empires on it. And we'd like to look over that with you. First of all, Nebuchadnezzar was ruling at about 605 BC. He besieged Jerusalem right around that time, which is the beginning of Daniel's story. That's when Daniel comes into the picture. That's when Nebuchadnezzar comes into the picture. That's when the kingdom of Babylon, because Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's father, had, yes, conquered the Assyrians and had begun to move through the earth, but it was Nebuchadnezzar that actually established the kingdom of Babylon during his reign. And then we find in the story, and this is actually, this story is written in chapter five of Daniel, something that I'm going to recommend that you read along with some of the other chapters on your own. This story is a story of when Babylon was conquered by the Medes and the Persians. It was in 539 BC that Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian, Darius's nephew, conquered Babylon. Do you remember? You remember the story and you look it up, Daniel 5. It's a wonderful story. It's an incredibly interesting story. 
where Daniel, where uh, Darius and Cyrus diverted the waters of the Euphrates River that ran right through the center of the Babylonian kingdom, the city of Babylon, so that they were able to go under the gates into the city and during Belshazzar's drunken feast, they took over the kingdom of Babylon. The Medes and the Persians took over Babylon in the year 539 BC. What about Alexander then? Alexander, <laughs> Alexander is represented uh, in another prophecy that follows in Daniel, and we will come to that, but he, he is represented as, a, as a, an animal, a beast, that is going so fast across the earth that his feet aren't even touching the earth. <laughs> we will come to that, that story a little bit later, and, and we will study that prophecy. But Alexander the Great conquered Medo-Persia in the Battle of Arbella, Interesting battle, too, by the way. I looked up some information on that battle, and I discovered that this took place October 1, 331 BC. It was the largest battle that Alexander the Great ever fought in his campaign to conquer the Persian Empire. The Persians had gathered together about 200,000 soldiers. 200,000 soldiers, and Alexander the Great only had 47,000. And yet, through his strategy, he was able to break through the ranks of the Persians, and he was able to conquer Medo-Persia, the Medo-Persian kingdom, and become the next great world leader. The kingdom of Greece, follows the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. Alexander the Great died at the age of 32, and his kingdom was divided among his four generals. And I could go through the details of this, but I won't do that tonight. They're very interesting. Four generals, which we will see in another prophecy. Remember the skeleton that we showed a picture of, and we talked about how Jesus had given us the skeleton of the template of prophecy. It was just a skeleton. It was all in what, 28 verses or less? I don't remember the exact number, but just that, the, that short passage, that short discourse in Matthew 24, Jesus gives us a skeleton of all that was to transpire from that day until the return, his return, the second coming of Jesus Christ. But as we went to Revelation 6 the next week, we put some flesh on that skeleton. And tonight we're putting on more flesh on that skeleton. We actually have here some of the history which will come. We're adding pieces to this picture of prophecy. Now, not just from the day of, days of Christ, but also from the days of Daniel on. And it sets a pattern, listen, this prophecy is like Daniel's template upon which we build like we did and we will continue doing on the, the prophecy of Jesus that he gave us in Matthew 24. We continue to build piece by piece until this picture fleshes out into a very clear picture of the things that are to take place between now and the time that Jesus comes. So. Then we have, in 168 BC, the end of the Grecian Empire, the end of the Macedonian Empire. During the Third Macedonian War, the Roman army of Lucius Paulus utterly defeated the forces of Perseus at the Battle of Pydna. This battle was a strong end to the Grecian Empire, the Empire of Alexander the Great. Even though he had died years before, 
His four generals had divided up the territory of the kingdom and had continued to rule the kingdom of Greece, the kingdom of Alexander the Great. But in this battle that took place, the Third Macedonian War in 168 BC, we have the end of Alexander the Great's empire and the beginning of the Roman Empire. So we have Rome now. So let's look at that. We're not gonna look at the picture, but let's look back. Let's look, or if we have the image, let's look at the image. We have the image with, uh, with the information on it. This image shows dates and names of kingdoms. So we have Babylon uh, being the world kingdom between 605 BC and 539 BC when the Medes and the Persians took over. Then we have the Medes and the Persians empire going from 539 to 331 when Alexander the Great conquered them. And then finally in 168, we have, we have a Rome. We have Rome beginning its rule of the world. And remember what, what Daniel said about crushing to pieces this iron was like a crushing force to the kingdoms around. What better description is there of the Roman Empire than this? It's so incredible how the language of Daniel 2 fits so well the history of these nations. And so we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, represented by the silver, Greece represented by the bronze, Rome is represented by the iron, and then in the feet of this image, we have iron still present because Rome still has an influence in the earth, but the kingdoms are scattered. There are kingdoms all over, you know, I mean, France and Greece and Spain and America and the, the British Empire, various kingdoms that were kind of broke off of the main stock of Rome and they continue to operate and to rule, but they do not mingle, they do not adhere. So there is not one world kingdom. However, we do see the iron still mixed in. Rome still plays a part in this picture. And uh, so, so interesting, isn't it? It's so interesting. And as I prepared for this message tonight, I was just in awe at some of the details of this story. And it's just fascinating. It's fascinating to see how God predicted clear back 600 years before Jesus was born, all that was to transpire in, in skeletal form this is Daniel's template. It's a skeletal form. Just by these various nations being identified, the time of their, of their rule and the description of the metal that, that represents them. What's going to happen is, as we go to some of the other prophecies in Daniel, we're going to see again flesh put on this. Again, these kingdoms are named again by name. Medo-Persia, Greece, is named in the prophecies of Daniel. But this is the beginning point for Daniel's prophecies of that which ultimately leads to the end of time. Six eras of time we find in Daniel 2. Now I'd like to recommend something to you. In chapter 3, we have the story. So we've kind of looked at one and two tonight. In chapter three, we have the story of Daniel and his three friends in the fiery furnace. Actually, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. We have that story. We have the story of them in the fiery furnace because they had refused to bow to the image that Nebuchadnezzar had made after the likeness of the image that he saw. He didn't want any nations to follow him. So he made an image that was, what, 90 feet tall? 
and it was all made of gold. And he called his kingdom together to bow down to the image. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down. And so they were cast in the fiery furnace. And guess who shows up in there with them? Jesus. The story is in Daniel 3. How about Daniel 4, which we aren't going to cover because these are not so much prophetic chapters. These have to do, this is the, the meat that goes around the bones of the prophecy. This is the interesting pieces of the story that are not simply prophetic in nature. So Daniel 4 is a story of Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. He has another dream. You need to read about it. And then in chapter 5, we have Belshazzar's feast. And as he is having this great feast, words are written on the wall by an unseen hand that point to his doom that night. You are weighed in the balances and found wanting. And as that angel wrote those words, the Medes and the Persians were making their way under the gates of the city into Babylon to take possession of it. And then Daniel 6. What's Daniel 6 about? Well, this is the story that we tell our kids in Sabbath school or Sunday school. This is the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And so these are all stories that you need to read and be inspired by. Next week, we're going to actually look at Daniel 7. Daniel 7 is the story of Daniel's next vision. It is the sequel to Daniel 2. The following week, we will study Daniel 8, another vision by Daniel that Daniel has. And it too is a sequel. And each of these visions help us to put more and more flesh on this template that Daniel has given us in chapter 2. I invite you to be with us next week. And if you're able to join us tonight for our Zoom discussion, uh, please do so. That will start at 7.30 Arizona and Pacific Daylight Savings Time. Let's end with prayer. Father in heaven tonight, What an amazing revelation you have given us in this book, Daniel, Daniel 2. And all around it is, is information and stories that make this so interesting. And furthermore, it helps us in our study to know those things which have been and those things which are, and those things which are to come. I pray that you will continue to ferment this message in our minds, the message from this book of Daniel, and help us to see how it fits together with Jesus' discourse in Matthew 24. And we, as we study in Daniel and Revelation and everywhere through Scripture, we will begin to see this complete picture of all that is to take place before you come and the things that we need to know and understand as we prepare for that great event. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.